Hi guys, uh, good morning. Um, so welcome to Empower SL uh, discussion on post-COVID impact on fashion retailing. Uh, why we selected uh, fashion retail, let me just give a bit of a context to it. Uh, you know, the retail industry uh, comprise a large amount of workforce in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, it uh, contributes to uh, a larger portion of the GDP as well. But uh, when it comes to retail, there are two segments, which is essential and non-essential. So the essential segment will perhaps survive in this crisis, but the non-essential segment uh, is at stake. So we would uh, wanted to hear from a diverse panel, uh, what do they think of the industry and how are they gonna face the challenges? How are they gonna convert the threats to opportunities in moving forward? So, uh, if when you look at the fashion retailing industry in Sri Lanka, apart from the export merchandising, this is only the local market. It approximately uh, contributes to 0.8% uh, to 1% of the GDP, uh, which comes to about 115 to 130 billion dollars per annum. And also, if you look at household income, it's about from monthly household income, it's about 2.4% to 2.5%. So uh, it's an important industry, especially considering larger workforce and also the considering the external uh, uh, suppliers and others who are dependent on the industry. So today we've got a diverse panel uh, from two main retailers who are mainly targeting the mainstream consumer and also uh, uh, an online press, uh, brand, uh, which is targeting perhaps the uh, upper mainstream consumer and also we've got uh, a local brand I mean locally manufactured and locally sourced and all uh, brand uh, uh, again uh, <clears throat> especially targeting a uh, uh, female segment in uh, a female demography so we've got a diverse panel today so uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the panelists uh, first uh, we've got uh, Akhil and uh, uh, Akhil and Ranis. Uh, Akhil represents uh, Fashion Buck. He's the director CEO. And uh, Akhil comes from both supply chain and finance background. And he's the, the next generation of the business. And then we've got Ranis. Ranis is uh, uh, representing No Limit. He's got a diverse uh, uh, background in consumer marketing. Uh, and his experience comes over about 15 years. And then we have uh, Rehana. Uh, Rehana has the first uh, online uh, e-commerce jewelry brand, which is Glittery. And then uh, we've got Selena. Uh, Selena uh, focuses on sustainable fashion and she runs a fair trade guaranteed company. And her passion is empowering Sri Lankan women in rural areas. So with that thought, uh, let me uh, 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 welcome all of you uh, to the forum. And, uh, uh, let me start. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, Akhil. Uh, Akhil, uh, uh, could you just uh, brief us uh, uh, what are the challenges and the opportunities as a mainstream retailer that you see uh, in this uh, scenario? Especially, we have looked at two scenarios. One is a rapid recovery, which will be within less than six months. Other one is a yeah. long-term recovery, which will be over one year. Yeah. Uh, first of all, good morning to all of you all. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, panel discussion. Well, there are a lot of challenges now because it's an unprecedented time and we've never actually faced a situation like this before. Right? Where all industries, not just uh, fashion retailing, retail as a whole, as well as other industries are also suffering in this time. So it's not easy for us to you know say this is the right move we need to take but it depends on the business at hand and depends on what your pre-existing conditions are and how you are going to take it forward from there so each business is different and how their approach is also going to be different how they take their approach so some of the big challenges i think in general is how are we going to manage our fixed costs especially when it comes to rent fixed staff costs and uh, how we are going to take it forward, especially in a lockdown scenario, what are our uh, you know, options, how we're going to you know, 
pay them because liquidity is key when it comes to a crisis, right? Yeah. And then when it comes to a bit more after lockdown, post lockdown stage, that's where the real problems will begin because you will have both your fixed costs coming into play as well as your semi-variable and variable costs. Yeah. So, and you're not going to see the same revenue inflows which you saw pre-COVID. So that's yes. a very challenging time ahead. Yes. So we'll see how we take it forward. It's not going to be easy. I'm sure we'll discuss in detail uh, throughout the forum there. Are. Yes. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, one thing, uh, Akhil, uh, do you see a recovery in uh, less than six months? Or how do you, how do you all forecast? Or do you all have a plan A scenario for this uh, quick recovery and a plan B scenario for the long term recovery? Well, definitely my personal opinion is no, we are not going to have a recovery in the next six months, especially in fashion retail. It's not going to be six months and it's highly doubtful if it will be in the next 12 months as well. Because we, I think most retail businesses have been anticipating an April seasonal sale and we've all been stocking up on that. And we've all had, you know, to invest heavily on our staffing, on our raw materials if you're manufacturing and also on our fixed uh, goods and stuff like that. So it's not going to be easy to recover from that. So definitely not in a six months. So that would be out of the question, I would say. But in the long term, we will have to look at how we are going to minimize on our costs, maybe focus on a clearance mechanism for uh, goods at hand to, you know, re-energize the business cycle. Because we need to keep it running. We have to be mindful that we have employees working for us, suppliers focusing and, you know, relying on us. So we need to be mindful on that and make sure that the business cycle gradually, you know, rotates. So that's one of the key things. So it would take, I think, minimum, minimum nine months plus. Okay. So are you looking at uh, restructuring uh, the business in terms of, uh, are you looking off layoff or are you looking off, uh, uh, how are you going to manage this uh, short to medium to uh, medium term cash flow? Okay, so definitely we need to first understand that it's going to be some tough decisions which we will have to take uh, ahead. Laying off is not in the cards as yet, but definitely we need to see what are our value drivers in the business and see where we are generating money, where we are generating business confidence. We should not just only look at the revenue streams, but we should look at the stakeholders as whole and see where we generate business confidence because we've been in the business for the past 25 plus years and we need to ensure that sustainable businesses is carried forward. So that's the critical point. For so having thought of that and looking at the consumer profile shifts, because they will not focus on fashion retailing in the next few months. They'll be looking at essentials, maybe education, healthcare, etc. So we will definitely have to look at a few non-essential services to be let down then we will have to look at streaming our product lines. We will have to, you know, narrow down our product lines. It should not offer a wide variety because choice is a luxury going forward. We need to focus on survival first and thereafter we can look at choice. So we need to, you know, restructure the business that way first at the first time. But then again, we also need to wait and see what options the government will come up and say, okay, we have this uh, lined up. It's only then we can really take a concrete decision because what we planned, example, maybe early April was, okay, the lockdown would end maybe in a week. The lockdown would end in about two days, three days, but it keeps prolonging. And we are really not in a position to go out there and say, all right, we will open all our operations on X day. And thereafter, we will take these, these, these decisions. It's not easy to say until we come out after the lockdown uh, is over. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Akhil, for that uh, introductory uh, uh, brief. Uh, let me move on to Ranis now. Uh, Ranis is representing No Limit, again, uh, 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 one of the big retail chains in the country. Both uh, Fashion Bug and uh, No Limit had uh, basically, they have stood for test of time. They have, uh, this is not the first time crisis. So, uh, Ranis, tell us about what's uh, your plans, how you're going to uh, face this crisis, and how do you see whether it's a rapid recovery or it's a long-term recovery? And what are your plans uh, yeah. for both scenarios? 
first of all uh, i hope my voice is clear enough yes sir yes yes you're clear yeah, lovely right so um, let me uh, build up the case from a global perspective right so understand uh, what exactly the situation that we are in so if you see um, uh, the, the the most developed countries like us the euro um, you know the, the prediction is uh, a muted uh, restoration will happen in about 3 years time so uh, you know it's, it's quite a long time so coming to the sri lankan context sri lanka if you see you know if you see the last uh, you know few weeks people are talking of um, you know the economy recovery in different shapes of curves you know they are talking of the l curve to the u curve and the v curve so um, while we understand all these you know trends and you know yeah the experts uh, uh, um, uh, comments the important thing that we have to understand is whatever the curve that we're going to take the first part of the curve is a decline right so um, so it is very clear it is very clear that we are going to face um, uh, in tough times so uh, this is for uh, you know business in overall business uh, set up in sri lanka so coming from there to fashion retail even i know for last few weeks if you see most of them uh, you know they when they were talking to me the main thing the question that they raised was whether clothing is a essential service or whether clothing is a need um, yeah i mean if you go to the theory uh, you know go by the need hierarchy yes you know clothing is a need but uh, fashion retail industry uh, we all being responsible we have we have developed uh, the industry uh, you know adding a lot of glam and uh, attributes and influence customer behavior uh, to change in a way that fashion retailing has become a lifestyle but uh, i would i would also say that if you take the sri lankan context uh, you know being a very diversified uh, segment um, looking at the market segmenting by behavior yes there is a segment which which consider clothing as a need then uh, my own definition uh, the second category would be the 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 fashion conscious customers who have moved from need to becoming fashionable and then you get the other segment uh lifestyle where shopping is a therapy for them right understanding all these three segments uh pesal i see a message saying it's not clear i hope the voice is clear enough for you guys. yes yes so yeah. you're That's right amazing. Yeah. Clear. love yeah, it so um so understanding these three segments like you know the uh customers who purchase for the need customers who are fashion conscious so it's a balance right and uh, customers who uh, purchase as a lifestyle we need to approach all these three in different uh, profiling different understanding so these three customer segments will respond to this industry in three different ways whatever the way they are going to respond for the next few months like i Uh, you know uh, very much agreeing uh, with akil it is going to be a tough uh, set of uh, you know months so it could be uh, due to uh, economic hardship or it could be due to psychological uh, you know uh, psychological shifts that they are going through uh, because right now for people we have not given uh, much choice right no one is brand conscious no one is uh, you know uh, convenience conscious they are just you know product driven right they are the best everyone is gathered around the product if they want a product they just want to buy it so from here shifting uh, to a post covid situation it will be very different i mean the market is going to respond to us very differently so the challenge for us uh, connecting back to your question uh, responding responding to these challenges of the 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 customer behavior we need to be really ready with our internal resources um, and the operating uh, market operating uh, environment and uh, okay just wash out the macro environment so macro environment is highly volatile you see like uh, you know last week we had plans to open up probably next week but today yesterday you know after seeing the news you know it's just, it's has changed you know so planning is changing um day by day you know our plans are changing so are we uh, open to adopt strategies or are we still you know uh, hardcore hanging on to our you know the annual strategy that we have set 
so these are the things that we really need to see to face the new challenges. So connecting the internal resources that is highly in control, like that is something that we can control. And the operative environment, again, because this pandemic has not affected businesses or brands in specific. This has affected uh, industries. So we, that's why we are talking of the fashion retail industry. So the operative environment, uh, if you look at, we need to get together, collaborate, and build the industry first. Then when we are ready with the industry, the platform, when the platform is set, yeah, we can look at brands separately. So I would say connecting the three dots of internal environment, operative environment, and uh, watching out the macro environment, which is not in our control, uh, could be something uh, from a strategy perspective uh, that we can face the challenges. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you, Ranis. Uh, so what you're saying is uh, the industry, the, there's, there's a need for industry collaboration to uh, yeah. fight this. Uh, yeah. we, I mean, moving forward. Who to uh, Rehana. Uh, Rehana is uh, uh, focusing on uh, pure, I think if I'm, uh, rectify if I'm wrong, Rehana, you're mainly focusing on uh, digital channel, right? Yes, there's a basically an entire vertical that's managed online. So we are a jewelry brand, but in yes. common. Okay, okay. So tell us uh, in terms of uh, I mean, being an online brand, like, you know, it perhaps could be an opportunity for you because the digital economy is growing. And uh, how do you see your, like, you know, the challenges for you and the opportunity for you uh, in moving forward? Okay, so just to give you a recap of, uh, is my voice clear because I'm using my mobile? Yes, yes, you're clear, yes. Yeah. So when we launched the business, this was five years ago. I mean, five years ago, we just had like two online players. So uh, top of mind, I think that was wow.lk and anything.lk, right? And at that point, buying a piece of jewelry, which predominantly is never a sole decision. A piece of jewelry is usually bought, you know, with your friends or you take a family member or you take a colleague shopping with you. So it's always two people giving opinions before purchases made compared to clothing, right? Uh, so it was a challenge when we initially launched. So I'll tell you, it took us a year just to get a licensing and also took us maybe a little bit more than a year to actually start sales, like first purchase to come through. So as a business model, I think fast forward right now, e-commerce is evolving. Like everyone I see is on uh, is trying to start a business. And what's so beautiful about the COVID is that, you know, people are using WhatsApp to start a business. People are doing home deliveries. They're no longer relying on Uber, Pick Me. They kind of took the situation to their hand as an individual or as a household to rectify, right? So I think the consumer market has gone from not knowing e-commerce to now completely embracing e-commerce. So there's no turning back from that learning, right? So this is something yeah. I'm seeing that's going to improve in the next six months because I'm looking at it from yeah. a consumer point of view. And the second yeah. thing that going to be the best, best part, you know, uh, of the entire shopping experience is that people are going to start using their cards. Uh, so the relying of, you know, having cash to make a purchase is it, that's going to drop, you know, it's a different scenario if people have the yeah. money or not, but the fact that people are willing to, you know, use their cards on an online platform is, is fabulous. Um, I think for the fashion industry, six months, definitely, you know, we are not going to recover, especially with the jewelry, there's going to be restraints in, uh, uh, materials that are being imported. We have very tight legislations, red tape on how much raw materials that can be bought in and, you know, what's bought in legally and what's bought in illegally. That's, that's the nature of the business, right? So saying all of that, I think the constraint yeah. we would find out, find is in manufacturing, uh, but there are, there's a lot more opportunities that are coming up. I think, you know, as a, a solely as a brand, I think it's a bit hard uh, for us to kind of, you know, uh, to sustain uh, operations for long, just selling what we are currently selling. So I think it's important right now, uh, even for my own brand, to see how we can collaborate and maybe bring in other vendors in who have excess supply, who fall into our you know, uh, ethics and vision and uh, values that drive our business. So I'm looking at it from a point of view where there's collaboration over competition to sustain the business, you know, into the next 12 months or maybe yeah. even. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Rehana. Uh, so now, now let me move on to uh, Selena. Uh, Selena, uh, being a, a brand which is, uh, I suppose, uh, mainly manufactured, sourced uh, locally, and you're also, uh, em I mean, empowering a lot of uh, uh, local, uh, uh, local uh, talent. So uh, what do you think for your business, uh, how it's going to be, whether it's going to be a short-term recovery or whether it's going to be a long-term recovery and uh, how are you going to face those uh, challenges in both scenarios? Um, thanks, Pejal. So uh, I think in the context of Celine, if I can start from there, and uh, even before that to move into how Sri Lanka's retail, fashion retail market was actually first hit during the COVID-19. But even if you take I mean, we've lost four seasons from that constitutional coup that started uh, two years ago in December. We lost the December season. Then uh, the Easter attacks, we completely, we managed Aurudu, but then the rest of the three months was completely hit. And then the elections came again and only people started shopping in December, um, at least our target market. And now we completely lost this season. So I think um, the hit for fashion retail is going to be twice as hard because it's not just COVID-19 that we had to face, but we had to face decline for the last two years. So having said that, that is the basis on which that uh, at least we were looking at it. So we already had seen a hit in our retail. So, but now going ahead, I, I agree with what everyone has been saying. I think the six months is a, a dream. You know, I mean, we have planned our contingencies for nine months. We don't expect the retail to grow anywhere uh, short, or short of nine months. And if it does, it will be great, right? Uh, because being a manufacturer, it gives us the, addition, the plus point because we can bring in our products into the market and yarn is the only thing that we import, import and there's no restriction on yarn as of now. So um, in that sense, uh, the product can be available on our side, but then, um, then what about the consumers, right? That's the main question. So um, the way I see it is that online marketing will take a big leap. Um, and like Rihanna said, uh, people are now getting used to paying by card, which was a big uh, challenge before. Uh, so I, the challenge will be for SMEs like myself to really go online because we have such a huge product variety, when it, especially when it comes to saris and, you know, locally crafted product. The, the kind of expense that we'll have to actually put our entire product line online will be a huge problem, um, especially for smaller brands. So in the short term, what we are doing as a company right now is pivoting into essentials. Uh, so we have started the production of fabric face masks, which are non-medical, non but that's keeping our businesses going and our expenses are being met. It has been cut down, like we have decided as a company not to lay off uh, any staff uh, because that's part of our fair trade commitment towards our people. We have about 300 people on our staff and uh, we've all taken pay uh, cuts, but no one is losing a job. But that means the company is hugely stressed because we are using the capital reserves that we have to kickstart the business to actually uh, meet this um, expense. But that's where the mass project is really coming handy. There's so much of demand for that. So that pivoting in time, and especially that pivoting was made possible because we are a family business and decision-making was so fast. Um, in an hour or two, we had decided that this is the way we were going and it happened, you know. So that's helping us take the short term hit to a certain extent. Um, but in the long term, and what we are focusing on now is also promoting our brand values. Because what we feel is that uh, consumer uh, perceptions will change post COVID. There will be so much focus on doing the right thing by the people, by the environment, especially what is safe to buy. Uh, does this give me security? Is this good for my me? Is it good for my family? Um, the value driven marketing is going to really, really be what's selling the product. And Celine has, a, Celine has an upper hand on it because we've always been a, so, we've been a social enterprise and our marketing is purely kind of value, value based. 
But I think even for larger brands, that is something that we'll all need to look at in order to meet this new consumer perception. And again, like everyone mentioned, uh, the social enterprise and ethical sector has a bit of an advantage because we were already collaborating before this uh, phenomena took place. So our brands were collaborating, our uh, supply chains were producing for each other. So in that way, um, the social enterprise kind of SME sector has a little bit of a room to navigate the short term. Um, but again, like, rightly as everyone said, uh, we it is only I think after next year we can really focus on going back to retail, uh, and that too not in the way that we used to retail. Um, so, for example, like even if we go online in the short term, there are issues where, especially if it's clothes, you can't really take exchanges, you can't take returns. You know, because that's there's a safety component yeah. attached to it. Yeah. So that's why, like this, whole, I think it was Rani or Akil who said, like the marketing plans is just thrown out of the window. You know, there, yeah. there you can't. Everything that we knew is changing, and uh, we need to kind of. We can't even plan because the situation is so fluid. All yeah. we can do is watch very carefully and be lean and agile enough to react really really fast because yeah. if we don't react fast we, we are going yeah. to miss out on a space yeah uh, with uh, let me also ask you uh, the recent study actually shows that uh, the within last few weeks uh, origin of product is important has become an important factor uh, for the local consumer actually 62 percent uh, says it's an important factor for them so uh, Celine being a brand which is like uh, I purely, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, mainly Sri Lankan uh, has a purely Sri Lankan origin. How do you see that opportunity to capture other than the essentials that you are focusing on right now? With the, yeah. No, you are. Um, so we saw this because we also export um, kind of ethical products. So we saw that in our European customers, this, this brand, this trend had already caught on quite some time ago. So they were very concerned about where their product came from. And for Celine's customer, it was always important where the product came from. So we, uh, but we are not in the mass, right? We are a very niche, we are a very niche yeah. product. So um, yeah. We, we had always focused on transparent supply chains, where your product, who was making your product, all that was information that was readily available to the customer. We had even gone as far as inviting anyone to come and see our factories. So these were part of the commitments we had taken as a business. And now I think post COVID, we wouldn't have to adjust so much because the customer will be looking for products like ours. But then our yeah. challenge then becomes, so if that is what the customer wants, how can then we then collaborate with mass brands to really bring our product to the masses, right? So it's not just uh, the ability to produce, the pricing, all of that. How can we produce in volume necessary to meet a yeah. mass demand? And that is going to be one of the biggest challenges for smaller uh, manufacturers who are kind of dependent locally for their manufacturing because as we all know Sri Lankan manufacturing is quite expensive uh, in comparison yeah. to uh, most of that's what's coming outside so those are the yeah. issues that we face with how do we meet the mass demand I don't know whether we can but this is where I guess where the collaboration comes in uh, where we start really thinking as a local economy you know because I think yeah like to or not at least for the next year we are going to have to really focus inwards it might not be a bad thing uh, but i don't know whether many of us are ready for it because we're so export dependent import dependent so what you're saying is uh, there is opportunity to export as well as uh, there will be opportunity to uh, in the local market as well and I, you're finding it difficult to meet the demand when the demand aggregate in both the export and the local market. Is that what you're saying? I believe so because our product is extensive. It's not, okay. it's not a mass product. 
Yeah. But the values, what I meant was the the values of our brand is what the what the post COVID customer would we want. want. But we will not be able to meet that demand because yeah. we have in no way anticipated this and yeah. and invested in our supply chains to meet such a demand. Um, right. That is my assumption. But yeah. even globally, we see that switch happening where the customers right. are really asking their retailers where are your products coming from but yeah. the challenge will be opposite for people like us who are manufacturers yeah okay uh, thank you selena i'll uh, come back to you now let me move on to uh, akil uh, akil uh, uh, percentage of your uh, like you know products coming uh, from broad like you know if you look at the composition what's the composition uh, of imports and how much of it you are sourcing locally? Well, uh, majority of our products are sourced locally. When you do have the specialized uh, items like maybe leather products or jewelry and stuff like that, which we do import, uh, but majority is sourced locally. However, okay. we also, you know, uh, engage with uh, importers. They already bring the products down for us and they you know, supplier. So we don't really get into the imports of it and all those because there's plenty of products available if you look at the right places. Right. So, so basically, you're saying you're sourcing locally, but then yes. the products are originally come uh, come from somewhere else. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so how do you see? Uh, uh, is there an impact on the uh, exchange rate? Because uh, definitely. Uh, um, yeah. So, how do you see that risk uh, impacting the business uh, in moving forward? Uh, right. Akir? So, off, off the top of my mind, I think we started this year with a USD rate somewhere close to the 180, if I'm not mistaken. And now right. it's touching the 200s just below right now. And I, I think we have to, you know, anticipate and, you know, forecast that the dollar will be over 200 plus because when the capital markets and the markets resume we are going to see a huge outflow of effects and we are not we are going to see the dollar going up further we're not going to see it yeah. coming down anytime soon so which yeah. means imports are going to be really expensive and as it is the government has you know issued a circular and said all right these are essentials which we can import and these we cannot import at the moment right? yeah so having said that Imports are going to be restricted and even for us being a retailer of this scale when we focus on products sourced from you know, foreign countries uh, from local uh, suppliers in here We are going to see a restricted range They're not going to be importing because they've already done their importing and supply to the market Anticipating a good sale in April So they're, yeah. they're right now. We, we need to look at the broader, you know supply chain what they've done is they've, you know, invested on their products, they've given to us, and we need to pay them up. So without a sale, yeah. we're going to, you know, have to struggle a bit to, you know, pay them up. So only when that yeah. comes through, the rotation would take place for them to start their imports back in. But it's not going to yeah. be at the same price they did before. Yeah. And we need to also make sure that we give a value product to our consumers. Our customers now, because especially when we are focusing on the mass scale retail, are focused to a specific pricing point. And they expect that the product is at this pricing point. So if we get a product at a higher price, suddenly they see, okay, there's no value in this product anymore. And it doesn't really, you know, give me a wow factor. Yeah. So that's the key thing. And also we need to take into account when this, you know, uh, crisis is ongoing, all industries are suffering. And that means people, are really having a tough time with managing their finances. They're not going yeah. to be, you know, go out there and shop whatever they need. They're going to be very picky. And if you don't have it at the right price point, it's going to be a big problem. So definitely prices are going to go up and it's a good chance for local manufacturers. Locally, we would see a higher adoption rate by large manufacturers to come in there and say, all right, we will take these small orders also going forward because to keep their factories running, keep their production lines going on. So that would take place in the future, definitely. So that's the expectations we all have. Right. Uh, Ranish, just a, just a small like you know, estimation. 
how much do you think like the as a percentage wise due to the attributable directly to the exchange rate the the your uh, cost uh, escalation would be uh, as a percentage uh, it, i think it, it would be uh, very parallel to the exchange rate increase itself because um like akil said uh, uh, the products are already bought right now for the whatever the uh, sale that we are expecting the products have been already bought so um good and bad you see good and bad in that but uh, yeah uh, so it's the same percentage parallel to the increase of the percentage uh, uh, of the exchange rate increase will have a similar impact on the cost as well okay okay so uh when it comes to no limit is it uh, like uh, same as uh, what akil mentioned your yeah. source mainly from uh, your direct Major, import yes. or majority of our products are uh, locally sourced um, okay. so that has given us an advantage uh, because you see fashion uh, if you look at the fashion uh, shelf uh, lifetime is should be short yeah. right so it should, should be keep uh, should keep changing so um, with that it, we have at an advantage when we uh, source locally um with the time duration taken uh, you know to uh, uh, bring down the products so yes majority of our products uh, are locally sourced locally sourced okay and uh, uh, let me also uh, ask you this uh, uh, now in terms of uh, frequency of purchase and the quantities uh, are like you know, there'll be similar certainly there is going to be an impact on that and also uh, uh your how you reach to the customer like you know your online versus offline uh you can you give us a, a like a, a idea of what you are planning to do in both like you know the the expected consumer uh, purchase behavior versus your uh, and also uh, how you are going to reach out to them in moving yeah. forward being a, i'm asking this question because being a mainstream player now we all have to go online like you know yeah. so how you are going to manage that uh, shift yeah so it's it's a it's a good question like see uh, we cater a mass market segment um, so then uh, it's not only the uh, customers who are probably today joining the webinar having the luxury to um, access a webinar online um, you know uh, with easy access so uh, it's a very big market if you see a very big market um, so even if you take the fashion retailing um you have a bigger portion coming from the unorganized retail okay unorganized unbranded retail fashion retail industry so unfortunately is not audited we don't have uh, you know industry audit done so um considering all these things um i cannot um, you know uh, weigh the market uh, opportunity but knowing the consumer behavior the the level of internet penetration or the usage behavior yes uh online there is there is a, a, a you know an opportunity um but it's not that fancy the way we think because you see it's not like a you know brand like georgia armani or yves saint laurent like you know the products are not properly defined we are into a retail a trading business where we buy and sell so brand to brand um you know the the definition of the product the sizing of the product how uh, the experience of the product is different right so it's not uh, manufactured uh, you know we, we have not uh, integrated backwards we don't have uh, a one place manufactured uh, products coming into the store so uh, there are a lot of challenges getting into online the good news is um, this lockdown period of the covid-19 pandemic has opened up um certain aspects like because the biggest challenge in sri lanka for online market was the trust factor when i say trust factor um it's about you know what they see especially clothing what they see online and what is being delivered um then uh, like uh, serena touched upon uh, the the credit card uh, uh, you know how the how the usage of the credit card the the not having the fear to use a credit card online um things like that and uh, uh, you know the assurance of the delivery so these kind of things had been really challenging uh, pre covid but now this has been opened up so that is the good news like you know we we have a platform where customers are mentally ready to accept online sales so unfortunately we did not have the 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 chance to try out our products 
clothing during this period because it was uh, not, uh, you know, uh, it was not enabled. Uh, it was only the essentials that was enabled. So, uh, but uh, the good news is the customer mentality, acceptance, yeah. because we see even uh, government organization, um, you know, SPC, I you know they, they had the facility to uh, order medicine through WhatsApp. So when when that kind of an impact happening on the online e-commerce business, yes, we have a huge opportunity there to invest. So then again, from that point, how are we getting into online? What kind of platform do we make it for our customers? Because you need to get the first time right, because you can't lose uh, trust uh, again. Because with now, right now, the customer does not have much options. So online is very fancy right now. But when everything is over, it's again a comparison between offline and online, right? They yeah. had the chance to walk into a store and buy. So yeah. then the online is competing against your own offline uh, business. Yeah. Getting into online is good because it will cut down on operational costs. You know, it will, it will make our, you know, the business model easy. And, uh, yeah. you know, the in future, future is going to be really good. Everything is fine. But I think right now we need to get into a proper plan as an industry, again, as an industry to lay the platform right. Lay the platform right for fashion retailing, just like what has happened to the FMCG or the supermarkets online. We need to right. get the platform right as an industry. So from there, we can uh, see how we can uh, take forward as different brands. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, throw that question at uh, Akhil as well. Akhil, how uh, online ready are you uh, as, a, well, as, we, a, as a company? As, as a company, we did uh, start uh, online. So we've uh, enabled our website and we did start our online platform about a year and a half back almost now. But having said that, online is a good start. It, we need to start somewhere to you know, get there eventually. But we need to see, all right, looking at the broader business as a whole, how much of revenue are you going to drive through online sales? Is it going to be equivalent to the broader you know, business? So we have the brick and mortar stores as well as the online platforms. Adoption rate in Sri Lanka has traditionally been low. But with this, we see, you know, it accelerating faster but that fear factor you know that factor of going online and buying and then when they have the, the you know questions as trust issues like how are we going to change sizes how are we going to you know get the product what we want are we sure of the fabric are we sure of this are we sure of the quality so all those questions will need to be addressed beforehand so that's something i think as a retailer who's been there for over 25 years, we've established up to a certain degree that, okay, we are a reliable retailer, we've been in the business for so long, and we don't see much of a problem coming in there. But then again, it's only the revenue factor. Is it sustainable to run the entire business from online operations? No, it's not. And I don't think it will be for the next time, you know, few years at least, for a retailer of our uh, size. It's going to be uh, tough. So we need to have both models yeah. going on, online and offline. Okay, let me uh, uh, throw this question at both uh, Akhil and uh, uh, Ranis. Uh, now, there's a question, uh, like when it comes to essentials, like, you know, infant wear, undergarments, uh, would you at least uh, want to start with those, maybe like, you know, grow, start online uh, uh, deliveries with those segments? There's, I think, question from a viewer. I think you can start. Right. Okay. So I think that's a very important uh, point right now. And we are also focusing, but then again, we need to keep in mind, yes, it may be an essential, but are we to, you know, risk our employees' safety through this? No, we're not ready for that. But having said that, we are looking at options of how we are going to get our products through various outsource services because we are not in a position to send our employees out there for just for the customer interaction and you know the confidence building. But we need to see how we are going to partner with others to get that product out there. It's a good opportunity and I think we should explore it if things you know, go uh, further in the lockdown. Okay, Ranis, what do you think of those yeah. two uh, segments, yeah. uh, infant brand and undergarments uh, being essentials? 
yeah actually so um under no limit we um, i do have two retail uh, arms like no limit and uh, glitch so um we actually have looked at it and we have already started uh, a similar thing uh, for in infant wear and uh, undergarments so um uh, so the, the the delay in uh, starting that operation is again agreeing with arkel um you know the risk factor where um, you know when when a, the clothing is being involved uh, you know uh, from one point to a customer's uh, you know residence or you know there there could be a risk with the you know ongoing situation so that was one of the main things that we held back so i think uh, since things are now you know uh, opening up uh, especially you know uh, in certain districts uh, identified uh, we have been able to do that and uh, right now we are focusing and uh, it is uh, in the plan okay um is uh, uh, okay let me move to rehana uh, so uh, since uh, you said that you are open even for uh, collaborations uh, there's a question from a viewer uh, what kind of uh, segments that you are looking at uh, for collaboration uh, rehana so we are looking at mainly lifestyle segments so like all our products are gift based uh so it's it's not not mainly for personal use so we're looking to collaborate with maybe uh other jewelry vendors that might be home based businesses gifts uh, may, but all made out of uh, sri lankan materials all handmade because that's our uh, company's uh, ethics as well so we work with local crafts people and all our products are handmade so if as long as the product falls into those guidelines uh, we are willing to have a look at uh, the vendor Or even even as a reselling option. Are right. uh, currently you are hundred percent focusing on uh, local market, or do you do any exports as well? Like about eighteen percent, we are selling directly okay. to consumers overseas. So because again, as we yeah. online based, you know, our inventory is all online. So we used to be a heavy inventory company as well, but the beauty of being e-commerce is like everything is online from our. inventory management squs so there's no finished goods so we go from order to production so we can as soon as an order is made online we can have a product uh, distributed in 24 hours so that was all possible because from start to end our sales to marketing to our data collection logistics is all tracked on uh, online basically so that okay. is how it is overseas if that's the question oh. Okay. Okay. Right. So, uh, do you, your current co-customer is? Uh, I I presume it's not the mainstream customer. It's probably upper mainstream customer. Uh, uh, right now, we are focusing. Actually, not so. Most of our customers are. Uh, I wouldn't call them mass mass customers, but I would say lower middle income customers. So a lot okay. of us are from Jaffna. You would see them from the East Coast. So I would even say thirty forty percent of our sales is. towards that area and then second category would be colombo and suburbs yeah. okay in terms of uh, gender composition uh, like you know the male to female how is uh, how is uh, the demand for uh, uh, demand uh, between the uh, like you know to gender yeah. very in interestingly over 60% of our products are male products sold so it's a lot okay. of women uh, is buying For the male, and then men buying for themselves. Right. So, sixty percent of sales are men. Yeah. All right. So uh, now, uh, see if your co-customer is probably like you know coming from the the masses, perhaps uh, uh, like you know they will again uh, have the the they will be forced with the decrease in discretionary income. Uh, so, uh, are you going to like you know you are going to change your pricing accordingly, or how are you going to restructure your uh, like you know pricing to suit the to uh, like you know this, this new normal situation? I think unfortunately we can't change prices because again our raw materials are imported, so that component the price is going to go high, right? Uh, uh, so what we are looking at is with the collaboration that we can bring in other merchandise that. fits our product offering and that fits you know what we stand as a brand and be able to price them at a lower price you know so that we at least have one segment of our category generating a revenue that will keep the company uh, running okay okay uh, let me move to uh, selina 
uh, Selina, uh, now uh, you said uh, uh, there is a, uh, the, in terms of manufacturing, local labor is also expensive. And also, uh, you said you're importing yarn. And uh, with the exchange rate also moving up, do you see uh, uh, that you will have to go for a price uh, hike in the new scenario? Um, absolutely. If we didn't have stocks of yarn at this moment, uh, we would be in a little bit of trouble, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, uh, but personally for Celine, we have managed to uh, plan in that sense. So we will be okay for the next year or so. But uh, as the industry as a whole, and an industry that is uh, importing yarn will definitely have, see an increase in the prices. Um, so this is, I guess, where branding again comes to play and i think it's very important for the listeners also to understand that i mean when you say no limit and fashion back there are mass brands uh, catering to a very different segment as opposed to what celine and glittery is so i think our problems are although the scenario is that uh, equivalent to all of us to say that in the next six months we will be having trouble with retail the problems that we have are quite different um but um, yeah so we will be the, the industry will have to have a price hike, the local manufacturing industry, because there's no way we can replicate that with any raw material in Sri Lanka. Right. Uh, so let me ask uh, this. Uh, in this scenario, what do you expect uh, from the authorities or the government to help? Uh, what, what, in what ways, in terms of policy, it could be it could, uh, like, you know, how they could, uh, how the government or the authorities could help you out in this scenario? Um, I, I, for one, I don't really depend a lot on government, but I think the sector as a whole, I think there was a mention here as well, how the fashion retailing sector has to work on this together. I think the SME sector too needs to look at this as a industry as a whole, you know, because uh, just looking at it company wise, I don't think will help anyone in the long term. Of course, it will help the people who are, um, I mean, it will help certain people more in the short term, but in the long term, we will all suffer. If as a sector, we don't understand what we're doing. So if you take the SME sector now, we need to be looking at the import uh, ban list, the, the gasset that has come out and see what are the areas that we can locally manufacture, you know? And then immediately we need to start our market research, our competitor research and understand what kind of pricing that we need to have in our product to be able to meet the gap in the imports. So this is what I meant when I said, um, so to so answer your question, like the authorities need to help, I guess, in a sense to plan for the sector, because that is the role of government, no, in a way to plan and to regulate when there is no formal um, grouping. So the garment industry has a grouping, the tea has a grouping. They are all grouped and yeah. they are talking to each other, like uh, the tech industry, the ICT, but the SME sector is not talking to each other. And I don't think the fashion retailing sector is talking to each other. Uh, let me interrupt, uh, Selina. Is, uh, isn't there a Sri Lanka Retail Association, uh, which comprises? I, I think... Yeah, I'm not a part of it. Sorry, that's why I was just pointing to Rani's and Akhil and realized yeah. I'm online uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, ask whether there is a kind of a a body which represents the entire fashion resale sector because we are not part of it maybe because we are in the traditional craft sector but um, the point is that if the government needs to really plan for us you know um, and and give us the kind of uh, lead to say okay this is what the semi sector needs to be looking at this is what the fashion retail sector needs to come on not to do our job but to guide us in this crisis i think because there's a lot of uncertainty and, uh, you know, you can't, like, unlike any natural disaster or any kind of uh, violent conflict or any of that we have faced in the past, this has no end. There is, yeah. you don't see an end and you don't know how the virus, what kind of form it will take after that. So in this crisis period, I think the government needs to give that reassurance to these sectors to say, okay, you guys are not being left out. These are the areas you can focus on. I think that's something the authorities should be doing at this point. 
Okay, what you're saying is uh, instead of the industries uh, coming together and saying, okay, these are our concerns, the, you, what you're saying is government should kind of lead the way? Or, um, because the government, I think, has done uh, uh, a dip moratorium and all of that, uh, like, you know, things that they could look at. But industry-specific issues, shouldn't it be coming from the industry itself? Uh, no, ab absolutely. So my point was where the industry is not organized in terms yeah. of the SME sector, it would be good for the government to take the lead because there might be a gap in the industry getting organized, you know? But if, of course, if the industry is organized, then absolutely yeah. it needs to come from the industry. Right. Um, okay, let me ask the same question. Now let me go back to Akhil and ask, uh, uh, what do you expect the authorities and the government perhaps to come and uh, uh, help you in this scenario? What are, what are your thoughts on that, Akhil? Right. So, uh, first to uh, uh, let Selina know, we, we do have a Sri Lanka Retailers Association, but it's not specific for fashion retailing. It's a broader retail yeah. uh, uh, yeah. forum. And uh, I think uh, we have submitted our proposals to the relevant authorities as to how we are going to go forward. Yeah. We need to be mindful that uh, retail contributes to approximately 31 billion US dollars locally. And, uh, we command about 14% of the labor force right. as a large retail uh, sector itself, not just right. fashion retailing. Yeah. And when we do address to the government our grievances, what we can do is we need to be mindful, all right, the government is also in a bit of pressure as to how to control FX rates, how they're going to service their own debts, how we're going to keep the country afloat, etc. So having said that, going forward, we need the government to act fast. They have done a tremendous job, but there's always more that can be done. Right. So we need them to act faster in disbursement of funds, if at all, to SMEs and all other retailers, what they have to be. Some of uh, our major said, proposal. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, you said you've already submitted a proposal. Uh, could you yes. just outline maybe what are the key, maybe two or three key points that you were looking at? Right. Some, some of uh, the key points were uh, tax uh, payments to be uh, given a grace period. And okay. uh, in terms of the financing side, there were proposals on how we can get uh, loans to be extended and uh, the interest rates to be further reduced if possible. So those were some of our ideas. But it does not cover the entire, you know, retailers as a whole to say, okay, this is the ideal way to go forward to survive for the entire retail industry. Each one, let's say fashion retailing, has key priorities within it. Maybe the entertainment industry will have different priorities. So priorities would vary within retail industry. And yeah. all those priorities would depend on each company's pre-existing conditions, pre-COVID yeah. conditions. Yes. So if you are a well-to-do company, well-liquid uh, company, then yes, you will not need immediate funding. But yeah. if you are a starter company, yes, you would need funds. So it depends on what your pre-COVID conditions are of the company. Yeah. But as a broader uh, aspect, I think we all are looking for some government relief as to how we are going to maintain our labor force and uh, how the government can help us with certain regulatory measures as to how to ease the burden on us because it has to be a win-win situation. We don't want to turn off or lay off our employees, but we need to, you know, engage with them and you know, move forward. We've gone this far, we can go the next miles as well. So that's what right. we need the government to step in and, you know, advise us and, you know, guide us on. Okay. Uh, Ranis, your thoughts on that? What do you expect the authorities to, how do you expect the authorities to help yeah. you at this time? Yeah, so um, I would like to, because uh, the, uh, the taxation um, and the loan repayment part was uh, covered, I would like to bring a different perspective to this. See, I always believe that, you see, our Sri Lanka um, uh, government uh, has been focusing quite a lot on tourism. So uh, how we market tourism uh, to the world is uh, as a holiday destination. So um, I would say we need to integrate shopping uh, to the tourism plans. Because now there are a lot of, uh, you know, shopping malls that have come up. And... Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of local brands um, that produces uh, amazing quality garments. Um, we are known for apparel manufacturing. 
So um, using these core uh, features of our country and um, having uh, big retailers who can cater to the foreign foreigners or the expats who visit Sri Lanka, we need to integrate shopping uh, to the uh, tourism plans. So market Sri Lanka as a shopping retail hub um, with along with uh, the, 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 the as a marketing as a holiday destination. So that's one of the areas that I would uh, say that the government should uh, look at from a tourism point of view because we, we really, really focus on tourism. I'm sure that right after this, uh, you know, the situation, we will focus back quite a lot on tourism. That is, uh, high, you know, that, that contributes quite a lot. So from that, this could be uh, another uh, avenue that we can generate more revenue to the country as well as retailers that they will get benefited. All right, let me just ask this question from you uh, on that, uh, uh, like in a pre-COVID scenario, uh, from your to total sale, how much did you generate as a, like a percentage from the tourist? Uh, yeah, that has, that has not been a big uh, market place for us because uh, once again, uh, that's, that's exactly this idea, whole idea is, uh, you know, have been bothering me. Why not be marketed? Because it's 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 mainly through you know it's always uh, the 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 final touch point uh, of tourists who visit Sri Lanka. Their main purpose to visit Sri Lanka is has never been uh, uh, shopping. Yeah. So I mean it is very uh, you know it is a very small market and also it is very uh, restricted to selected showrooms. Um, so I mean so th th I cannot define as a percentage, but it's a very small market. So this, this gives us uh, a lot of opportunity because, uh, you know, the number of tourism that we uh, receive to our country and uh, the amount of money that they spend here, why not we um, add on shopping uh, to the wallet share? So this is exactly the reason why I'm telling that we need to start marketing uh, Sri Lanka as a retail hub, um, probably the retail hub in Asia. Okay, so what you're saying is, uh, like, you know, apart from the, the, the financial, uh, like, you know, relief, uh, perhaps look at creating new market segments like where we were not strong at before, like tourism, uh, in moving forward, right? Yeah, because, because uh, yeah. Pesela, if you see tourists who visit, uh, uh, you know, our showrooms, they actually um, see a lot of value for money, um, you know, in terms of products that they get to choose and uh, to buy over the price, right? So uh, it's a quite a big market. Whoever visits, I mean, uh, they leave uh, very happy and satisfied. So that gives us a lot of hope that there is a big market there. So this, you know, cannot be taken from our marketing budgets to, uh, you know, market it to the world. Mm -hmm. So why not we integrate this whole uh, shopping thing to our tourism plans and talk about, you know, a holiday destination as well as a shopping hub, uh, you know, a retail therapy uh, kind of an approach. Uh, yeah. Tourist. Yeah. Can I just yeah. add to that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I was going to mention that before as well. I think um, I think it's a really good point by Ranis because when you say tourism too, we should uh, categorize that. I am looking at the Indian market, at the Maldivian market, the the volume of which. Uh, the Indian, especially the Indian market is, can really, it's unparalleled, right? So without, um, if you are promoting shopping as a destination, like Sri Lanka as a shopping destination, we focus on those markets. That, that marketing goes into the Indian markets and not to Europe or to Southeast Asia or any of that. You know, so I think that is a really big opportunity for Sri Lanka, even our online markets. I think what Akhil and Rani is probably also meant is that having a investing in an online platform for the Sri Lankan market is really, uh, you know, it's not going to generate the kind of revenues that are needed uh, to really keep the business going because the, especially the online market is so small currently. But if we can open and to the Indian market, there's a huge, huge opportunity there, which I don't think we have actually looked at. Um, so uh, I think just adding to Ranisa's point that that could be a very strong uh, revenue generator for us. Okay. Um, so uh, 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 let me uh, move on to Rehana now. Uh, Rehana, you've been uh, all throughout an online uh, retailer and uh, any plans to go uh, 
uh, like you know, uh, to a, a physical presence after the after the post-COVID scenario? Uh, not currently. So the business plan has always remained to be online, and our focus has always been into scaling internationally. Uh, the challenge that okay. we faced is that you know the uh, the logistics logistics has just been a little bit expensive because you know garment to garment they don't have good FTAs in place you know so there's always a loophole and you are, the end customer always unfortunately somehow gets charged a duty but uh, that's because there's no proper you know FTAs in place but I, I think the government should look at that and also help SMEs that have products like mine to be able to sell very easily to you know an overseas customer because if you look at Etsy and a lot of these uh, e-commerce companies internationally, most of their sales is from uh, international customers. And that's because they have proper direct shipping in place, which Sri Lanka currently lacks. I think if they could open that up and also integrate PayPal, you know, the, you know, the, the whole demand for our products will definitely open up, you know, because the barriers to buy our product is less because Sri Lanka produces high quality products, you know, Sri Lanka has good craftsmanship and has, has good raw materials. It's just a matter of us, you know, making the entire transaction easier to the customer. Okay, so then uh, being a sole digital channel, now in a scenario where the digital economy is going to play a big role, I mean, uh, uh, in future, uh, at least the, we have started it. Uh, what yeah. do you think, uh, like, you know, getting the conversion from, like, you know, physical to offline to online, like, you know, for, for you to get more customers to pen, uh, increase more penetration, what do you propose government or the authorities to how do they, how do you expect them to help you out? I'll be very honest with you. You know, the government, I don't think is in position to do much. I mean, unfortunately, the country has had back to back, you know, the war, then the Easter attacks and now this, right? So as a country, as a government, the government has been changing hands so often as well. So there's less that they can do. But I think what they can actually do for all the industries to try and bring the industries together. Because I feel as retailers, online or offline, we are working to protect our own entity. We are not coming together to protect uh, the industry as a whole, right? So I see that with tourism and that's why there's a lot more focus on tourism. I see that with hotels, I see that with restaurants, you know, they're working together to ensure that that industry thrives. So I feel that's something the government should try and initiate. And the secondary thing, the whole debt monetarium, you know, I, like, I, I contacted the banks to find out about it. And being an SME, they're asking you for an asset. And especially in a digital company, we, we, everything is digital. That's our asset, right? So uh, yeah. I, I think it, it has not been planned out too well, I think, by the government. And just hoping that, you know, they will look at it in a bit of a long-term scenario and not put out things that will fix a three or six month period for a business. All right. Uh, okay, so what I'm saying is they are not looking the intangible value that you have generated uh, uh, in terms of uh, as a collateral. Uh, yes, they're looking at like, still you know, their instrumentality of fixed asset, you know. So if an SME okay. has a fixed asset uh, they, and that is generating money, they wouldn't go to a bank for a loan, right? To, ex to infuse extra right. cash into the business. Okay, so from what I gather is from, uh, uh, from especially from both you and uh, Selena, that uh, even though there is a Sri Lanka Retailers Association, that's predominantly catering to the probably the larger players like uh, Akil and uh, Rani's. Uh, what you're saying is SMEs, uh, the SMEs voice is not properly no. heard or is there a, is that there's no, forum for the for SMEs to uh, uh, probably uh, enter, in, uh, enter a dialogue with the government or the authorities is that uh, is that what I'm gathering yes definitely yeah not that we are aware of at least right Rana I mean we yeah, not that I'm aware of them, but from what I know I, I I mean I work with the authorities quite closely on certain projects and definitely no uh, group that's bringing them all together Okay. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. So uh, let me uh, uh, then uh, uh, move into uh, probably uh, the Q and A. Uh, let me take a question. Uh, uh, there is a question. Uh, clothing is usually tried on before purchasing. Are you thinking of virtual fitting? How do you get the clothes to fit consumers? 
I'll uh, probably start with uh, uh, Akil and then uh, go around. Right, so that's a very good uh, question and it's a bit of a challenge for us as well. But looking at virtual fitting is going to take some time. You're not going to have that implemented in the next three months, six months, or at least maybe in the nine months because it takes considerable investment. And fashion is something which keeps changing. So you're not going to have a blanket uh, uh, garment uh, throughout the period of time. You're going to have this uh, different outfit every time, right? So to adopt to that, it's not going to be easy to have a virtual fitting. But for the time being, what we could do is, you know, bring up con consumer confidence and say, okay, we are undertaking these safety practices and procedures within our team. And we can guarantee you up to a certain degree safety on it, right? And in terms of fitting on, in terms of size and all those, what we could do is we, as a brand, we have, uh, we, we do follow international sizing and we do follow, you know, the proper guidelines for it. So what we say is, okay, we can give you the size chart and we can give you, you know, an assurance that you could uh, adopt to these size charts. So that's what we can do in the short term uh, immediately. It's not going to be easy to, you know, come into virtual because it's very expensive to start off uh, in a mask year. Uh, Ranis, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I, I, I do 100% agree uh, of what Akil mentioned. Uh, it's a very expensive uh, process altogether because, you know, you're talking of uh, RFIDs, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, backward, uh, you know, uh, processing to be done, uh, starting from the supply point of view, actually, you know, even if I imports or local supplies, then, you know, the pressure starting from the retailer, it might you know, keep on, uh, you know, uh, pressurizing the suppliers too. Like, you know, it should start from the supply itself, having the RFID systems to, you know, the tags to whatnot. So it is, uh, again, an expensive system. And uh, also, um, I don't know whether the acceptance, when you have, I mean, yes, right now, yeah, we are in a situation, um, okay, this, this might last for some time, but right after that, uh, when you have the option to physically fit on, um, I don't know what, what would be the customer's choice, you know, um, because Sri Lankans, uh, you know, Asians are highly experience driven when it comes to fashion retailing, uh, buying clothes. So they want to experience. That's, that's one of the reasons why online uh, for fashion retailing has not picked up the way it is for electronics. So I uh, you know uh, other se sectors. So uh, that experience might be different. It, it will be very nice. Yeah. Selected showrooms or, you know, probably for a boutique uh, store, having uh, a system like that is uh, it's pretty good. You know, it, it might give a lot of value. But for a mass brand, uh, looking at the investment, the return, uh, I think it is uh, it is important. But uh, um, you know, if you if you are implement for a short term, I don't think it's a very viable option. But we can look at selected showrooms, selected showrooms where you know uh, high tech savvy customers are walking in and uh, having a high acceptance on these kind of uh, facilities. Yeah, we can look at for those showrooms. Okay, so uh, let me move to uh, Rehana. So who have been uh, only selling on online? Perhaps, uh, what are your learnings? What could you share with the rest of the, uh, 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 with the audience? How do you convince a customer uh, uh, online? What are the touch points, uh, Rehana? Like because, so yeah. I would first like to add that, you know, last year we actually began this entire try, try at home uh, uh, concept. So it's basically, uh, I mean, if you look at India, right, India is far ahead in what they do. So their clothing and jewelry is a word, they have virtual touch points. So it doesn't mean that the customer walks into the store and they use a digital uh, solution. It's, it's actually in the form, an, uh, form of an app or it's on their website where the product can be virtually, you can virtually fit it on, right? So I saw that in my recent trips, like, you know, my past trips to India and that jewelry, they're selling jewelry using that. And that's amazing, right? So that's one step ahead of seeing an actual product on a website to actually just fitting it on using an app. And the sales have been quite good. So we are, we started that process for Glittery last year. And yes, it's taking us, taken us so long to actually be, mount the SQUs onto the uh, digital app. Um, I wouldn't call it expensive. Then again, I don't know because our SQs 
uh, less compared to most of the large retailers. But I think it is possible because there are solutions out there that allows mass brands to put up their inventory into digital platforms to try it at home or try it from your office or you know through an app or maybe like a, a self-facing camera and things like that. So this is just sharing my experience on that uh, point. But how do you convince a customer to get online? I think it's right now it's easy, right? Because they, they, they have self-learned what online, being online and buying online is. I think it's first paramount to be transparent because transparency about the company and your products and what you sell, price points are key. Second thing is to be consistent in what you share. Uh, People kind of misunderstand that, you know, e-commerce and social media or digital marketing is about sales. It's not about selling a product. It's about how you engage to your consumer from a social point of view. Because what social media does is bring everyone together on a social platform, right, than a physical platform. So these platforms, like Facebook and Instagram, lets you penetrate into their, you know, home or office through an app, right? And through that, you're able to actually collect a lot of data on customer behavior, customer trends. You're able to predict ahead of time, or at least we are able to predict ahead of time, like what the customer's demand is going to be three months, six months ahead. So based on that, on that we start our design process, right? So we always stay one step ahead of the curve when it comes to design and marketing. And that's all possible because of social media and our fan base interactions. So I think knowing your customer knowing your target market and the right platform and being consistent on it and transparent on it is like the key for any business okay uh, let me move on to selena selena uh, you said uh, that you do exports as well and what percentage of it uh, comes at the exports and also uh, uh, and when you export uh, you perhaps there is no uh, uh, physical interaction with the customer at the point of purchase so how do you try, like you know plan to uh, uh, manage uh, this uh, like you know trying out uh, exchanges and all that uh, moving forward? Um, Patiently, we don't export uh, B two C, so it's always to distributors. So then that does right. uh, apply to us. Uh, yeah, right. so, uh, we don't have a B two C option at the moment. Right. Two distributors okay. and the US. Right. So are you looking at kind of a virtual fit, uh, uh, like, you know, why are the distributors to the end, uh, to the end customer? Like, you know, how um, do the distributors get into the uh, yeah, end so, customers? So basically, right, what they have been doing so far is they've been having their online sites and they've been going into retail shops. So I think the right. distributors are having uh, some problems these days, hence why our, some of our orders are postponed or cancelled, right? As is most yeah. of the garment sector. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something for all of us to think about, including yeah. them that like Rihanna said, like you need to move like India for example, is quite fast, right? They've moved yeah. into all these virtual fitons and all of that. So the question is, do we have a choice not to, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, that's a real serious question concerning the kind of investment bigger brands have to make to uh, to enable those facilities but uh, it's one of those things that the longer we wait the more we lose out but yeah. if it's also a huge sum of money to pl pl put in so um, it's, it's one of those catch-22 situations what do you do and that's my way of thinking was like okay now if we do invest in our online I'm not really going to focus on the Sri Lankan market but I'm going to focus on the regional market as opposed to the European or the uh, kind of American markets. I'll focus on the regional market for myself because that investment then can be justified because I can't go to that extent just looking at the numbers in the Sri Lankan market. You know, it's just, and especially our product yeah. is quite niche. Um, so that's the way yeah. I'm looking at it, Pashala. Yeah. And I would just actually. Like, so yeah, just sure. to add one more thing, I think most of us, like, you know, even it took me some weeks to kind of change my mindset to accept that, you know, people call it the new norm. I think, unfortunately, what we get out post-COVID is the new normal. And I, I personally don't foresee this situation changing. I feel like, you know, asana generations to come are going to be shopping differently, going to be having different environments. And we will have more closer communities, you know, where 
you might no longer go to a restaurant you might go to some other house and eat so you know things are going to change so i think it's time i think as retailers and the only way we can bring the industry together is to kind of accept it and not think of it as okay in a year things are going to change i think you know the corona might go off now we might have something else in the future so i think it's important to sort of you know accept that this is what it is i rana is spot on i mean that we the world will change the way it looks at things and uh, i mean we need to make that hard hard calls because even if evidence and data is not there to back these decisions right now uh, i think that's the first movers you know these are the people who are going to take the risks and go ahead um, because she's absolutely right the world will change and especially the younger consumer will absolutely change the way that they interact with the world so unless we are ready we will we will be irrelevant yeah it's one of those two high situations yeah just uh, just one uh, like a maybe not quite related to this but i just want to ask you since you brought it up uh, you said you are distributing through distributors actually in sri lankan exports i have seen in many industries that we sell it to the distributors and without reaching the end consumer so there we actually really uh, the we lose a lot of margin because the uh, that's be enjoyed by the uh, the intermediary what are the main barrier of reaching out to the end consumer selena uh for me it's access to the how do you access the end consumer right uh because if you are to access the end consumer you need your sales points you also need very big budgets for your marketing so that's kind of where we have uh not been able to do so i mean for example there are paid people like spasilon and dilma like they've gone ahead and they franchise their brands and they are reaching an end customer so i think that's where we also need to step up and think okay we are we are going to stop white labeling and we are going to move our brands to reach there but it's the marketing and all of that more than anything else and i also i think the we haven't thought that far facial i think this is what everyone's realizing now right we are a 30 year business and we didn't think we we just didn't think right these were all things that never took priority we spoke about it for so long but it just never came up and now someone in the organization is saying i told you so right <laughs> so it's one of those things and that's why i said at the very start we need to be really really fast uh every second we spend thinking might be yeah. losing out on Uh, an opportunity that is coming our way yeah um so uh, with that uh, let me move on to uh, akil so perhaps akil uh, you could uh, this could be your closing remarks as well since we have uh, spent uh, almost one and a half hours now uh, so there will be a new normal that will require customers to uh, like you know go through certain process even the entering and also uh, when it comes to when since uh, april is a uh, like you know uh, april is something that uh, can easily be uh, easily that a virus could uh, get transmitted so there'll be a lot of precaution matters that you'll have to take as well uh, with all of that uh, how are you going uh, how are you going to uh, manage this uh, new normal uh, in moving forward and uh, we answering to that uh, actually uh, you could uh, add your closing remarks as well so Right, so that's that's actually a good point. So the new normal, we are not going to see a large inflow of customers coming into our stores. So that's an obvious fact going forward. Right. Number two is in terms of, all right. So there has been a statement saying out that okay, transmission of viruses is possible through clothing. Maybe may not be. I'm not too sure. However, having said that, what we can do as a retailer is. give the assurance that we are taking the utmost steps to bring you know safety uh, up there so fashion bug we have focused on safety predominantly to our employees as well as to our customers right so what we do is if we do uh, you know open all our stores we will be you know scanning the temperatures we will be recording them ensuring that our statement is taken that they have been under quarantine for 14 days or 21 days if they are across district all our touch points will be cleaned with uh, you know uh, chemicals 
in terms of returns, returns will be closed. We will be giving them uh, you know, the size guide assurance that okay, we will be adhering to this. At the moment, we will have to you know stop uh, returns. We will have to suspend that policy of uh, returns and exchanges for safety reasons. But uh, we are looking at how we are going to incorporate that in the future as well. So those are some of the safety features we can take at the moment. There are more we can do, and we are looking into those uh, possibilities as well. But having said that, there is only so much that we can do to bring the trust in our consumers, right? So what we really hope is that we have been a trusted brand for over 25 years, and we hope that our consumers will acknowledge that fact and, you know, take our word for it that we have undertaken these steps and we are doing our utmost to ensure their safety as well. So that's what uh, answering your question there. Uh, as for my closing points, I would say going forward, the new co uh, normal is going to be uh, less walking. People are going to be more focused on different priorities, and we need to be more agile in our way of operating. So, what predominantly we've been doing because it's a fashion related industry, we work on a bottom up as well as a top down approach in our hierarchy. So, getting the feedback on what are the latest trends, etc. So, in the immediate short term, we will have to work on a top-down approach because we've got to look at our company as a whole and say, okay, we've got so much of inventory. We need to, you know, clear them out. We need to see how we can clear them out as much as possible because we have commitments to our suppliers. As a brand, we need to be responsible of the entire industry because if one company in the industry collapses, it's going to cause chaos. It's going to be like the Lehman Brothers in 2008. It's going to cause chaos. So we need to be mindful of that. So that's, I think, uh, my last point, I would say. Okay. Thank you, Akhil. Uh, uh, Ranis, uh, you can uh, like, you know, also answer the question of uh, how you adapt the new normal and also uh, add your closing remarks, uh, Ranis. Yeah. So uh, um, right now, um, we had the liberty to open a few showrooms outstation where the curfew was uh, lifted. Um, that's like in Kurunagara, Kegal, Ratnapura and Kandy. So um, these showrooms, we have made sure that we 100% follow what uh, the government authorities have, uh, you know, mandated to us um, and probably uh, more than what they have expected. So um, even from there and there had been audits happening, um, you know, we have been, uh, you know, extremely, uh, you know, careful and have done our part uh, from our end. Just to add on uh, to the things that we have done, like you know, um, one meter distance maintaining is uh, very much strictly followed. Um, before entering to exiting uh, the showroom, we have made uh, you know available um, the facility to to wash hands, to sanitize, and uh, certain facilities like you know fit on facility is being disabled right now. Uh, product exchange is not uh, possible. Um, so um, and even we don't even use carry bags. Uh, while shopping um, and um, we encourage credit debit cards uh, payments and that is also being swiped by the customer itself you know our cashiers have taken precautions you know they are with the you know the pro proper you know uh, the mask to the gloves and uh, the possible places has been disinfected things like that has been um, done um, so um, it's again you know with all these things I mean um, uh, because th there is uh, still a need even during this time where customers have to purchase clothes. Like initially at my uh, first, uh, you know, uh, attempt that I was talking about the customers who the different buying behaviors, there is still a customer, um, you know, behavior where they really have to, uh, you know, um, buy uh, for a particular need. So, um, so we, we have made uh, enable um, all the safety precautions um, and uh, make sure that the customer is safe from our end um, at our base. So that is one thing. And uh, the future business uh, for us, um, again, we, 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 we do have to accept the decline of uh, the economy and uh, how market is going to respond to us. Um, customer behavior will definitely uh, take a big turn. Um, online uh, platforms needs to be uh, marketed and uh, we need to have a balance of online and offline, uh, understanding the Sri Lankan market and the behavior and the, you know, the level of access to uh, those facilities. 
yeah, internet penetration is growing, but e-commerce is another level. You know, it's it's having internet uh, uh, connection uh, is having internet connection is not about uh, getting into an e-commerce platform. So uh, there's a lot of things to be done from our end. Um, so we are working on it and trying to bring a balance of uh, online and offline. And um, we are not forgotten our uh, the, the youth segment, the millennials, which takes a bigger portion of the population now. So uh, they are grown with the internet and they are very comfortable in uh, doing transactions online. So um, so we are trying to handle all these elements and um, and also um, understanding the customer behavior. Um, you know they will be more hygiene uh, conscious, and um, you know they will have. I would say they will be more disciplined. Than ever because we, we learned how to be disciplined uh, than uh, how we were you know during this period uh, so uh, those things are in consideration when we uh, conduct you know when we uh, lay out our plans in terms of operation uh, even marketing we have looked at our you know ways where we can uh, assure uh, our customers you know uh, the safety factors uh, the confidence and the trust factors how we can build on uh, for our customers so um, those are the things that we have taken. Um, so um, as my, uh, you know, the clo uh, closure statement, I would, I would like to tell, you know, businesses now should focus more um, uh, towards, you know, uh, being customer centric. We cannot take uh, the liberty that we had uh, even uh, to influence customer behavior. It's changed and customers have come to a realization on many things, you know, uh, customers have uh, been, um, away from uh, the routine, the traditional way of you know uh, marketing, they have learned a lot uh, from that and being out of it. So having that comparison, they will have a different approach towards businesses and brands. So uh, I think uh, being customer centric and getting your internal resources and capabilities, uh, you know, understand, analyze those, and uh, make sure that they are ready to face the new normal. Okay, okay, thank you, Ranis. Uh, well, I'll let me move to uh, Rehana. Uh, Rehana, how do you adapt to the new normal, especially like, you know, now uh, uh, since you've been uh, de delivering products and how you ensure the safety and hygiene at the point of delivery and also, uh, 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 like, you know, if you can adapt your closing remarks uh, with that. Uh, so, Basically, the first step that we did was, this was last year, post Easter attacks, was to set up secondary production units in houses of our craftsmen. Like I said, we work with a lot of craftsmen, so we set up a backup production there already, so that, you know, when the main production that's housed in Colombo, if that is no longer functional, we can have production going on in their homes. So that has come to use now, so that has kicking into place, so the so we are getting orders. It's just that we are unable to uh, deliver through logistics. Uh, so production in that way, hygiene is carefully monitored in their homes and also uh, in uh, factories, right? Uh, again, in the same sanitizing process, you know, we only ha we will only have a rotation of craftsmen with a, a rotation of production managers. So in that sense, we'll ensure that there are only two people at any given time during a during a uh, station at one production unit. Uh, so that's one step that we did. In terms of logistics, I think for us, it's uh, we've always been quite hygienic uh, because of the nature of our product, right? So we deal with a lot of chemicals, we deal with a lot of uh, raw, basic raw materials to finish goods. So there's always been a hygiene process that's maintained from the craftsman to the purchasing point of view to your finished good product. So even when the product is delivered, most of the time we try and ensure the product is cleaned with the chemical and handed to the customer at the point of delivery. So we've all, 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 always had that you know, process in place. So I think it's now pretty much trying to implement that and to ensure that's thoroughly followed by everyone. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Rehana. And, uh, uh, Selena, let me move to Selena. Uh, how do you uh, ensure that the safety and hygiene and how do you adapt to the new normal? And uh, you can adapt your closing remarks as well, Selena. Um, thanks, Special. So if you take our retail shops, currently we have been able to open Kurunagala. 
and like what uh, Akil and Rani said, all the precautions have been taken, returns, exchanges. I think that will be the new normal with no returns and exchanges. Might not be a bad thing for retailers. But uh, so all that has been taken in terms of the retail. I'm not right. going to go into it because those are the very same government uh, kind of standards that we have to adhere if we want to be in the retail. And when it comes to our manufacturing, um, so export companies can work now with uh, permits. Uh, so we have a, P a PHI who had come in, uh, visited the factory. We had to rearrange our factory lines. Uh, we had to keep the kind of social distancing um, distance, the one meter distance between our machines. Only 50% of our factory can work. Um, so this is for the production of the masks. And Celine already has a very strong home working unit. We have over 250 people working from homes. So that mechanism was already set up. So uh, we are able to continue production, all, although at a slower rate, taking all the precautions that is kind of audited by the PHI very frequently. Uh, we have to say that the government is taking it quite seriously, you know, like uh, they do visit very often and uh, the curfew passes are checked very uh, kind of uh, religiously so uh, that's the way we are continuing our production so that's how we are adjusting to going about business in this period and we are only making masks at the moment uh, we are not making any other because we have no orders basically and there's a huge stock of our fashion for made for the Aurudu so uh, I think my closing remarks would be that um, in the short term uh, a group of us who are ethical and sustainable brands will soon kick off a, a kind of a collaborative um, marketing campaign which, which others can jump on board who share the similar values as us to really buy local and to create the uh, message that the old trend is the new trend. So to, that's the idea to get rid of the inventory that, is, that has been accumulated. So we don't ask customers to subscribe to new trends. We are saying whatever is in the market is what you should be buying. Don't ask for new things because there's a lot of people with a lot of inventory. You know, that's the biggest issues most, most of the retailers have at the moment. So it will be a collaborative campaign. And I think when Sri Lankan small business brands get together, I think it will be quite powerful. So that will be launching shortly. So watch out for that. And uh, as a business for the long term, we are really looking at uh, online space, looking at the region as a market. And like everyone said, having a balance between online and offline, because we've already felt that the millennial market was rejecting the kind of retail shopping experience. This might change also after COVID because people want to come, they want to support neighborhood brands, they want to support local brands. So I feel there has to be a healthy balance between online and offline and a product balance. Like um, I think it was Akil who said, there'll be some products that are really kind of uh, held at production and there'll be a big uh, good balance between essential and non-essential. And finally, I think we'll be really going ahead with our value-based marketing as opposed to looking at product-based marketing because consumers will want to know what a business stands for and not what the product a business makes. Um, I think those are very two big differentiators that businesses will have to understand that. And finally, an advice for the SMEs is that we need to be able to now cater to the local demand that will come from big retailers like Rani's and Fashion Bag, No Limit, etc. So right now we should be using this time to get our pricing right, to get our quality right, uh, to be able to produce in volume, to gather our supply chains. We need to be protecting our workers now because when that demand comes, we, we, we need to be working. And also we need to be promoting our brands because the new normal will be a transparent business Transparent business, transparent supply chain. So brands and value-based branding will be very important in that context. So we need to be, uh, you know, storytelling at this moment and not focusing on product. So that's my kind of final uh, in input as well. Thank you. Thank you, Selena, for that passionate uh, statement. Uh, 
and uh, everyone uh, thank you very much akil rani so rehana and uh, selina um, you all uh, uh, represent the, the i would say the young generation uh, and also uh, who probably have a big role to play because of the industry size and looking at the number of families people who are dependent on uh, your businesses so uh, as uh, as a youth the uh, forum this perhaps became a kind of a youth forum and uh, uh, from mempa vessel we wish you all a very best uh, to probably uh, take uh, sri lankan uh, sme and this april sector to greater heights uh, and uh, thank you for again uh, committing your time with us today and uh, for the audience uh, uh, this is a uh, be beginning of uh, uh, of our webinar series uh, so stay tuned with mempa vessel uh thank you all for joining us thank you very much and have a good day thank, thank you thank you patala thank, thank you president thanks to all good luck good luck thank you